Chapter 3 Beginning of His Work This morning, of which I have just spoken, I went down to the office, and there I was having the renewal of these mighty waves of love and salvation flowing over me, when Squire W. came into the office. I said a few words to him on the subject of his salvation. He looked at me with astonishment, but made no reply whatever that I recollect. He dropped his head, and after standing a few minutes, left the office. I thought no more of it then, but afterward found that the remark I made pierced him like a sword, and he did not recover from it until he was converted. Soon after Mr. W. had left the office, Deacon B. came into the office and said to me, Mr. Finney, do you recollect that my cause is to be tried at ten o'clock this morning? I suppose you are ready. I had been retained to attend this suit as his attorney. I replied to him, Deacon B., I have a retainer from the Lord Jesus Christ to plead his cause, and I cannot plead yours. He looked at me with astonishment and said, What do you mean? I told him in a few words that I had enlisted in the cause of Christ, and then repeated that I had a retainer from the Lord Jesus Christ to plead his cause, and that he must go and get someone else to attend his lawsuit. I could not do it. He dropped his head and, without making any reply, went out. A few moments later, in passing the window, I observed that Deacon B. was standing in the road, seemingly lost in deep meditation. He went away, as I afterward learned, and immediately settled his suit. He then betook himself to prayer, and soon got into a much higher religious state than he had ever been before. I soon sallied forth from the office to converse with those whom I should meet about their souls. I had the impression, which has never left my mind, that God wanted me to preach the gospel, and that I must begin immediately. I somehow seem to know it. If you ask me how I knew it, I cannot tell how I knew it any more than I can tell you how I knew that that was the love of God and the baptism of the Holy Ghost which I had received. I did somehow know it with a certainty that was past all possibility of doubt, and so I seem to know that the Lord commissioned me to preach the gospel. When I first was convicted, the thought had occurred to my mind that if I was ever converted, I should be obliged to leave my profession, of which I was very fond, and go to preaching the gospel. This at first stumbled me. I thought I had taken too much pains and spent too much time and study in my profession to think now of becoming a Christian, if by doing so I should be obliged to preach the gospel. However, I at least came to the conclusion that I must submit that question to God that I had never commenced the study of law from any regard to God, and that I had no right to make any conditions with him. I therefore had laid aside the thought of becoming a minister until it was sprung in my mind, as I have related, on my way from my place of prayer in the woods. But now, after receiving these baptisms of the Spirit, I was quite willing to preach the gospel. Nay, I found that I was unwilling to do anything else. I had no longer any desire to practice law. Everything in that direction was shut up and had no longer any attractions for me at all. I had no disposition to make money. I had no hungering and thirsting after worldly pleasures and amusements in any direction. My whole mind was taken up with Jesus and his salvation. And the world seemed to me of little consequence. Nothing, it seemed to me, could be put in competition with the worth of souls. And no labor, I thought, could be so sweet and no employment so exalted as that of holding up Christ to a dying world. With this impression, as I said, I sallied forth to converse with any with whom I might meet. I first dropped in at the shop of a shoemaker who was a pious man and one of the most praying Christians, as I thought, in the church. I found him in conversation with a son of one of the elders of the church, and this young man was defending universalism. Mr. W., the shoemaker, turned to me and said, Mr. Finney, what do you think of the argument of this young man? And then he stated what he had been saying in defense of universalism. The answer appeared to me so ready that in a moment I was enabled to blow his argument to the wind. The young man saw at once that his argument was gone, and he rose up without making any reply and went suddenly out. But soon I observed, as I stood in the middle of the room, that the young man, instead of going along the street, had passed around the shop, had climbed over the fence, and was steering straight across the fields toward the woods. I thought no more of it until evening, when the young man came out and appeared to be a bright convert, giving a relation of his experience. 
he went into the woods and there, as he said, gave his heart to God. I spoke with many persons that day, and I believe the Spirit of God made lasting impressions upon every one of them. I cannot remember one whom I spoke with who was not soon after converted. Just at evening I called at the house of a friend where a young man lived who was employed in distilling whiskey. The family had heard that I had become a Christian, and as they were about to sit down to tea, they urged me to sit down and take tea with them. The man of the house and his wife were both professors of religion. But a sister of the lady who was present was an unconverted girl, and this young man of whom I have spoken, a distant relative of the family, was a professed universalist. He was rather an outspoken and talkative universalist, and a young man of a good deal of energy of character. I sat down with them to tea, and they requested me to ask a blessing. It was what I had never done, but I did not hesitate a moment, but commenced to ask the blessing of God as we sat around the table. I had scarcely more than begun before the state of these young people rose before my mind, and excited so much compassion that I burst into weeping and was unable to proceed. Everyone around the table sat speechless for a short time, while I continued to weep. Directly, the young man moved back from the table and rushed out of the room. He fled to his room and locked himself in, and was not seen again till the next morning when he came out expressing a blessed hope in Christ. He has been for many years an able minister of the gospel. In the course of the day, a good deal of excitement was created in the village by its being prepared what the Lord had done uh, by its being reported, I should say, what the Lord had done for my soul. Some thought one thing, and some thought another. At evening, without any appointment having been made that I could learn, I observed that the people were going to the place where they usually held their conference and prayer meetings. My conversion had created a good deal of astonishment in the village. I afterward learned that some time before this, some members of the church had proposed in a church meeting to make me a particular subject of prayer, and that Mr. Gale had discouraged them, saying that he did not believe I would ever be converted, that from conversing with me he had found that I was very much enlightened upon the subject of religion, and very much hardened. And furthermore, he said that he was almost discouraged, that I led the choir and taught the young people sacred music and that they were so much under my influence that he did not believe that while I remained in, him, in Adams they would ever be converted. I found after I was converted that some of the wicked men in the place had hid behind me. One man in particular, a Mr. C., who had a pious wife, had repeatedly said to her, If religion is true, why don't you convert Finney? Why don't you convert Finney? If you Christians can convert Finney, I will believe in religion. An old lawyer by the name of M., living in Adams, when he heard it rumored that day that I was converted, said that it was all a hoax, that I was simply trying to see what I could make Christian people believe. However, with one consent, the people seemed to rush to the place of worship. I went there myself. The minister was there and nearly all the principal people in the village. No one seemed ready to open the meeting, but the house was packed to its utmost capacity. I did not wait for anybody, but arose and began by saying that I knew that religion was from God. I went on and told such parts of my experience as it seemed important for me to tell. This Mr. C., who had promised his wife that if I was converted he would believe in religion, was present. Mr. M., the old lawyer, was also present. What the Lord enabled me to say seemed to take a wonderful hold upon the people. Mr. C. got up, pressed through the crowd, and went home, leaving his hat. Mr. M. also left and went home, saying I was crazy. He is in earnest, said he, there is no mistake, but he is deranged, that is clear. As soon as I had done speaking, Mr. Gale, the minister, arose and made a confession. He said he believed he had been in the way of the church, and then confessed that he had discouraged the church when they had proposed to pray for me. He said also that when he had heard that day that I was converted, he had promptly said that he did not believe it. He said he had no faith. He spoke in a very humble manner. I had never made a prayer in public, but soon after Mr. Gale was through speaking, he called on me to pray. I did so, and think I had a good deal of enlargement and liberty in prayer. We had a wonderful meeting that evening, and from that day we had a meeting every evening for a long time. The work spread on every side. 
As I had been a leader among the young people, I immediately appointed a meeting for them, which they all attended, that is, all of the class with which I was acquainted. I gave up my time to labor for their conversion, and the Lord blessed every effort that was made in a very wonderful manner. They were converted one after another with great rapidity, and the work continued among them until but one of their number was left unconverted. The work spread among all classes and extended itself not only through the village but out of the village in every direction. My heart was so full that for more than a week I did not feel at all inclined to sleep or to eat. I seemed literally to have meat to eat that the world knew nothing of. I did not feel the need of food or of sleep. My mind was full of the love of God to overflowing. I went on in this way for a good many days until I found that I must rest and sleep or I should become insane. From that point I was more cautious in my labors and ate regularly and slept as much as I could. The word of God had wonderful power, and I was every day surprised to find that a few words spoken to an individual would stick in his heart like an arrow. After a short time I went down to Henderson, where my father lived, and visited him. He was an unconverted man, and only one of the family my youngest brother had ever made a profession of religion. My father met me at the gate and said, How do you do, Charles? I replied, I am well, father, body and soul. But, Father, you are an old man, all your children are grown up and have left your house, and I never heard a prayer in my father's house. Father dropped his head and burst into tears and replied, I know it, Charles. Come in and pray yourself. We went in and engaged in prayer. My father and mother were greatly moved, and in a very short time thereafter they were both hopefully converted. I do not know, but my mother had had a secret hope before, but if so, none of the family, I believe, ever knew it. I remained in that neighborhood, I think, for two or three days and conversed more or less with such people as I could meet with. I believe it was the next Monday night they had a monthly concert of prayer in that town. There were there a Baptist church that had a minister and a small congregational church without a minister. The town was very much of a moral waste, however, and at this time religion was at a very low ebb. My youngest brother attended this monthly concert of which I have spoken and afterwards gave me an account of it. The Baptists and Congregationalists were in the habit of holding a union monthly concert, but few attended, and therefore it was held in a private house. On this occasion they met as usual in the parlor of a private house. A few of the members of the Baptist Church and the few Congregationalists were present. The deacon of the Congregational Church was a spare, feeble old man by the name of M., He was quiet in his ways and had a good reputation for piety, but seldom said much upon the subject. He was a good specimen of a New England deacon. He was present, and they called upon him to lead the meeting. He read a passage of scripture according to their custom. They then sung a hymn, and Deacon M. stood up behind his chair and led in prayer. The other persons present, all of them professors of religion and younger people, knelt down around the room. My brother said that Deacon M. began as usual in his prayer in a low, feeble voice, but soon began to wax warm and to raise his voice, which became tremulous with emotion. He proceeded to pray with more and more earnestness, till soon he began to rise upon his toes and come down upon his heels, and then to rise upon his toes and drop upon his heels again, so that they could feel the jar in the room. He continued to raise his voice and to rise upon his toes and come down upon his heels more emphatically. And as the spirit of prayer led him onward, he began to raise his chair together with his heels and bring that down upon the floor. And soon he raised it a little higher and brought it down with still more emphasis. He continued to do this and grew more and more engaged till he would bring the chair down as if it would break to pieces. In the meantime, the brethren and sisters that were on their knees began to groan and sigh and weep and agonize in prayer. The deacon continued to struggle until he was about exhausted, and when he ceased... My brother said that no one in the room could get off from his knees. They could only weep and confess and all melt down before the Lord. From this meeting, the work of the Lord spread forth in every direction all over the town. And thus it spread at that time from Adams as a center throughout nearly all the towns in the county. I have spoken of the conviction of Squire W. in whose office I studied law. I have also said that when I was converted, it was in a grove where I went to pray. Very soon after my conversion, several other cases of conversion occurred that were reported to have taken place under similar circumstances. 
that is, persons went up into the grove to pray, and there made their peace with God. When Squire W. heard them tell their experience one after another in our meetings, he thought that he had a parlor to pray in, and that he was not going up into the woods to have the same story to tell that it had, that had been so often told. To this, it appeared, he strongly committed himself. Although this was a thing entirely immaterial in itself, yet it was a point on which his pride had become committed, and therefore he could not get into the kingdom of God. I have found in my ministerial experience a great many cases of this kind, whereupon some question, perhaps immaterial in itself, a sinner's pride of heart would commit him. In all such cases, the dispute must be yielded, or the sinner will never get into the kingdom of God. I have known persons to remain for weeks in great tribulation of mind, pressed by the Spirit, but they could make no progress till the point upon which they were committed was yielded. Mr. W. was the first case of the kind that had ever come to my notice. After he was converted, he said the question had frequently come up when he was in prayer, and that he had been made to see that it was pride that made him take that stand and that kept him out of the kingdom of God. But still he was not willing to admit this even to himself. He tried in every way to make himself believe and to make God believe that he was not proud. One night, he said, he prayed all night in his parlor that God would have mercy on him, but in the morning he felt more distressed than ever. He finally became enraged that God did not hear his prayer and was tempted to kill himself. He was so tempted to use his penknife for that purpose that he actually threw it as far as he could that it might be lost so that this temptation should not prevail. He said that one night on returning from meeting he was so pressed with a sense of his pride and with the fact that it prevented his going up into the woods to pray that he was determined to make himself believe and make God believe that he was not proud. And he sought around for a mud puddle in which to kneel down that he might demonstrate that it was not pride which kept him from going into the woods. Thus he continued to struggle for several weeks. But one afternoon I was sitting in our office and two of the elders of the church with me when the young man that I had met at the shoemaker's shop came hastily into the office and exclaimed as he came, Squire W. is converted, and proceeded to say, I went up into the woods to pray and heard someone over in the valley shouting very loud. I went up to the brow of the hill where I could look down, and I saw Squire W. pacing to and fro, singing as loud as he could sing, and every few moments he would stop and clap his hands with full strength and shout, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Then he would march and sing again, and then stop and shout and clap his hands. When the young man was telling us this, behold, Squire W. appeared in sight, coming over the hill. As he came down to the foot of the hill, we observed that he met Father T., as we called him, an aged Methodist brother. He rushed up to him and took him right up in his arms. After setting him down and conversing a moment, he came rapidly toward the office. When he came in, he was in a profuse perspiration. He was a heavy man and cried out, I've got it, I've got it, clapped his hands with all his might and fell upon his knees and began to give thanks to God. He then gave us an account of what had been passing in his mind and why he had not obtained a hope before. He said as soon as he gave up that point and went into the woods, his mind was relieved, and when he knelt down to pray, the Spirit of God came upon him and filled him with such unspeakable joy that it resulted in the scene which the young man had witnessed. Of course, from that time, Squire W. took a decided stand for God. Toward the spring, the older members of the church began to abate in their zeal. I had been in the habit of rising early in the morning and spending a season of prayer alone in the meeting house. I finally succeeded in interesting a considerable number of brethren to meet me there in the morning for a prayer meeting. This was at a very, very early hour, and we were generally together long before it was light enough to see the read, to see to read. I persuaded my minister to attend those morning meetings. But soon they began to be remiss, whereupon I would get up in time to go around to their houses and wake them up. Many times I went around and round and called the brethren that I have thought would be most likely to attend, and we would have a precious season of prayer. But still the brethren I found attended with more and more reluctance, which fact greatly tried me. One morning I had been around and called the brethren up, when, and when I returned to the meeting house, but few of them had got there. Mr. Gale, my minister, was standing at the door of the church, and as I came up, all at once the glory of God shone 
upon and round about me in a matter, manner most marvelous. The day was just beginning to dawn, but all at once a light perfectly ineffable shone in my soul that almost prostrated me to the ground. In this light it seemed as if I could see that all nature praised and worshipped God except man. This light seemed to be like the brightness of the sun in every direction. It was too intense for the eyes. I recollect casting my eyes down and breaking into a flood of tears in view of the fact that mankind did not praise God. I think I knew something then, by actual experience of that light that prostrated Paul on his way to Damascus. It was surely a light such as I could not have endured long. When I burst out into such loud weeping, Mr. Gale said, What is the matter, Brother Finney? I could not tell him. I found that he had seen no light, and that he saw no reason why I should be in such a state of mind. I therefore said but little. I believe I merely replied that I saw the glory of God, and that I could not endure to think of the manner in which he was treated by men. Indeed, it did not seem to me at the time that the vision of his glory which I had was to be described in words. I wept it out, and the vision, if it may be so called, passed away and left my mind calm. I used to have, when I was a young Christian, many seasons of communing with God which cannot be described in words, and not unfrequently those seasons would end in an impression to, on my mind like this, Go, see that thou tell no man. And I did not understand this at the time, and several times I paid no attention to this injunction, but tried to tell my Christian brethren what communications the Lord had made to me, or rather what seasons of communion I had with him. But I soon found that it would not do to tell my brethren what was passing between the Lord and my soul. They could not understand it. They would look surprised and sometimes I thought incredulous. And I soon learned to keep quiet in regard to those divine manifestations and say but little about them. I used to spend a great deal of time in prayer. Sometimes I thought literally praying without ceasing. I also found it very profitable and felt it much inclined to hold frequent days of private fasting. On those days I would seek to entirely be alone with God and would generally wander off into the woods or get into the meeting house or somewhere entirely by myself. Sometimes I would pursue a wrong course in fasting and attempt to examine myself according to the ideas of self-examination then entertained by my minister in the church. I would try to look into my own heart in the sense of, ex of examining my feelings and would turn my attention particularly to my motives and the state of my mind. When I pursued this course, I found invariably that the day would close without any perceptible advance being made. Afterwards, I saw clearly why this was so. Turning my attention as I did from the Lord Jesus Christ and looking into myself, examining my motives and feelings, my feelings all subsided, of course. But whenever I fasted and let the Spirit take its own course with me and gave myself up to let Him lead and instruct me, I universally found it in the highest degree useful. I found I could not live without enjoying the presence of God. And if at any time a cloud came over me, I could not rest, I could not study, I could not attend to anything with the least satisfaction or benefit until the medium was again cleared between my soul and God. I had been very fond of my profession. But as I have said, when I was converted, all was dark in that direction, and I had no more any pleasure in attending to law business. I had many very pressing invitations to conduct lawsuits, but I usually, <clears throat> but I uniformly refused. I did not dare to trust myself in the excitement of a contested lawsuit. And furthermore, the business itself of conducting other people's controversies appeared odious and offensive to me. The Lord taught me in those early days of my Christian experience many very important truths in regard to the spirit of prayer. Not long after I was converted, a woman with whom I had boarded, though I did not board with her at this time, was taken very sick. She was not a Christian, but her husband was a professor of religion. He came into our office one evening, being a brother of Squire W., and said to me, My wife cannot live through the night. This seemed to plant an arrow, as it were, in my heart. It came upon me in the sense of a burden that crushed me, the nature of which I could not at all understand, but with it came an intense desire to pray for that woman. The burden was so great that I left the office almost immediately and went up to the meeting house to pray for her. There I struggled but could not say much. 
I could only groan with groanings loud and deep. I stayed a considerable time in the church in this state of mind, but got no relief. I returned to the office, but I could not sit still. I could only walk the room and agonize. I returned to the meeting house again and went through the same process of struggling. For a long time I tried to get my prayer before the Lord, but somehow words could not express it. I could only groan and weep without being able to express what I wanted in words. I returned to the office again and still found I was unable to rest. And I returned a third time to the meeting house. At this time the Lord gave me power to prevail. I was enabled to roll the burden upon him, and I obtained the assurance in my own mind that the woman would not die, and indeed that she would never die in her sins. I returned to the office. My mind was perfectly quiet, and I soon left and retired to rest. Early the next morning, the husband of this woman came into the office. I inquired how his wife was. He, smiling, said, She's alive and to all appearance better this morning. I replied, Brother W., she will not die with this sickness. You may rely upon it, and she will never die in her sins. I do not know how I was made sure of this, but it was in some way made plain to me, so that I had no doubt that she would recover. She did recover and soon obtained a hope in Christ. At first I did not understand what this exercise of mind that I had passed through was, but shortly after, in relating it to a Christian brother, he said to me, Why, that was the travail of your soul. A few minutes' conversation and pointing me to certain scriptures gave me to understand what it was. Another experience, which I had soon after this, illustrates the same truth. I have spoken of one young woman as belonging to the class of young people of my acquaintance who remained unconverted. This attracted a good deal of attention, and there was considerable conversation among Christians about her case. She was naturally a charming girl and very much enlightened on the subject of religion, but she remained in her sins. One of the elders of the church and myself agreed to make her a daily subject of prayer, to continue to present her case at the throne of grace morning, noon, and evening until she was either converted or should die, or we should be unable to keep our covenant. I found my mind greatly exercised about her, and more and more as I continued to pray for her. I soon found, however, that the elder who had entered into this arrangement with me was losing his spirit of prayer for her, but this did not discourage me. I continued to hold on with increasing importunity. I also availed myself of every opportunity to converse plainly and searchingly with her on the subject of her salvation. After I had continued in this way for some time, one evening I called to see her just as the man, just as the sun was setting. As I came up to the door, I heard a shriek from a female voice and the scuffling and confusion inside the door, and stood and waited for the confusion to be over. The lady of the house soon came and opened the door and held in her hand a portion of a book which had evidently been torn in two. She was pale and very much agitated. She held out that the portion of the book which she held in her hand Rather, she held out that portion of the book which she had in her hand and said, Mr. Finney, don't you think my sister has become a universalist? The book was a defense of universalism. Her sister had detected her reading it in a private way and tried to get, her away, tried to get it away from her, and it was a struggle to obtain that book which I had heard. I received this information at the door, whereupon I declined to go in. It struck me very much in the same way as had the announcement that the sick woman already mentioned was about to die. It loaded me down with great agony. As I returned to my room, at some distance from that house, I felt almost as if I should stagger under the burden that was on my mind. And I struggled and groaned and agonized, but could not frame to present the case before God in words, but only in groans and tears. It seemed to me that the discovery that that young woman, instead of being converted, was becoming a universalist, so astounded me that I could not break through with my faith and get hold of God in reference to her case. There seemed to be a darkness hanging over the question, as if a cloud had risen up between me and God in regard to prevailing for her salvation. But still the spirit struggled within me with groanings that could not be uttered. However, I was obliged to retire that night without having prevailed. But as soon as it was light, I awoke, and the first thought that I had was to beseech the God of grace again for that young woman. I immediately arose and fell upon my knees. No sooner was I upon my knees that the, than the darkness gave way, and the whole subject opened to my mind. And yes, and as soon as I pleaded for her, God said to me, Yes, yes. 
If he had spoken with an audible voice, it would not have been more distinctly understood than was this word spoken within my soul. It instantly relieved all my solicitude. My mind became filled with the greatest peace and joy, and I felt a complete certainty that her salvation was secure. I drew a false inference, however, in regard to the time, which indeed was not a thing particularly impressed upon my mind at the time of my prayer. Still, I expected her to be converted immediately, but she was not. She remained in her sins for several months. In its proper place, I shall have occasion to speak of her conversion. I felt disappointed at that time that she was not converted at once and was somewhat staggered upon the question whether I had really prevailed with God in her behalf. Soon after I was converted, the man with whom I had been boarding for some time, who was a magistrate and one of the principal men in the place, was deeply convicted of sin. He had been elected a member of the legislature of the state. I was praying daily for him and urging him to give his heart to God. His conviction became very deep, but still, from day to day, he deferred submission and did not obtain a hope. My solicitude for him increased. One afternoon, several of his political friends had a protracted interview with him. On the evening of the same day, I attempted to carry his case to God, as the urgency in my mind for his conversion had become very great. In my prayer, I had drawn very near to God. I do not remember ever to have been in more intimate communion with the Lord Jesus Christ than I was at that time. Indeed, his presence was so real that I was bathed in tears of joy and gratitude and love, and in this state of mind I attempted to pray for this friend. But the moment I did so, my mouth was shut. I found it impossible to pray a word for him. The Lord seemed to say to me, No, I will not hear. An anguish seized upon me. I thought at first it was a temptation, but the door was shut in my face. It seemed as if the Lord said to me, Speak no more to me of that matter. It pained me beyond expression. I did not know what to make of it. The next morning I saw him, and as soon as I brought up the question of submission to God, he said to me, Mr. Finney, I shall have nothing more to do with it until I return from the legislature. I stand committed to my political friends to carry out certain measures in the legislature that are incompatible with my first becoming a Christian, and I have promised that I will not attend to the subject until after I have returned from Albany. From the moment of that exercise the evening before, I had no spirit of prayer for him at all. As soon as he told me what he had done, I understood it. I could see that his convictions were all gone and that the Spirit of God had left him. From that time he grew more careless and hardened than ever. When the time arrived, he went to the legislature, and in the spring he returned an almost insane universalist. I say almost insane because instead of having formed his opinions from any evidence or course of argument, he told me this. He said, I have come to that conclusion not because I have found it taught in the Bible, but because such a doctrine is so opposed to the carnal mind. It is a doctrine so generally rejected and spoken against as to prove that it is distasteful to the carnal or unconverted mind. This was astonishing to me, but everything else that I could get out of him was as wild and absurd as this. He remained in his sins, finally fell into decay, and died at last, as I have been told, a dilapidated man, and in the full faith of his universalism. <laughs>